Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I want to welcome everybody to tonight's forum. I want to give a special welcome. We have a bunch of students from Emerson here tonight to see their favorite professor, <laughs> who she's promised like straight A's for your attendance. So that's what she said in the green room. So anyway, you can hold her to it, make her keep that promise. Uh, but we're excited to have everybody here tonight, and we invite all of you to stick around afterwards uh, for the debate. Uh, but tonight, we've got our own version of Talking Heads. I want to put our panel up against anything you would be seeing if you were at home watching on CNN, MSNBC, or Fox. Uh, we've got four uh, folks who have had a lot of interaction uh, in, around debates in various capacities. Their bios are in your program, uh, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But I do want to invite all of you to participate, um, not just in the question and answer period that will follow, uh, but also on Twitter. So the hashtag for tonight is IOP Debate. Uh, so please, if you're tweeting tonight, you can use that. Uh, we also are going to try something new. We're going to have a chance to ask a question after the debate tonight to some of our panelists. Uh, and we want to do that via Twitter. So if you do hashtag ask IOP, that'll give us an idea of some of the questions that we could ask uh, some of our experts. And then we're going to put a video up on the IOP's website tomorrow with the answers to some of those questions. So ask IOP to ask a question, not tonight, uh, but that'll get asked after the debate. Uh, and then. IOP debate to engage uh, via Twitter. So tonight, uh, let's just dive into the conversation, uh, but I'll do a quick introduction. Brett O'Donnell is an IOP fellow, is a, a, a Republican communications and debate consultant, uh, has worked for a lot of candidates most recently. Uh, Michelle Bachman, and a little bit with Mitt Romney in the primary. Carol Simpson was the first woman to moderate a presidential debate uh, in 1992, and was a journalist with ABC News for many years, and now is a leader in residence at Emerson College. Mark McKinnon, another IOP fellow this semester, uh, was chief media advisor to President George W. Bush, as well as some other candidates and campaigns over the years. And Tad Devine, we welcome back, who was a fellow a year ago. Uh, Tad was a fellow in the fall of 2011, uh, worked for many campaigns, including Senator Kerry's 2004 campaign and 1988 Dukakis campaign, and a whole host of campaigns all across the, war the globe. He's actually done debate prep uh, for candidates running for prime minister of a whole host of countries. So, if you want to learn more, dive into the program. Let's begin with, um, I just ask each of you, from your perspective, you've participated in a lot of debates, from the advising, the coverage, everything. Uh, tell us, uh, maybe tell us a quick story or, or what's your take on what it was like. Uh, you know, our title is From Prep to Podium, so uh, <laughs> Brett, why don't you give us a little story, or give us a little background sure, insights. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it, 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 a candidate uh, preparing them, they're human beings, and uh, and, and they go through some of the same fears that, uh, and same frustrations that you or I might go through if we had to go through those experiences as well. And so we put them through a lot. To get them ready, you have to really do three things. You have to prepare them knowledge-wise. They have to know their position on issues. They have to know the other person's position. They have to do a lot of studying on the background of uh, policy. But then they also have to execute a strategy in the debates. And then finally, like a, an athlete or anyone else you might coach, They've got to be mentally prepared. And so in debate prep, uh, we, we really try to make them see what it would be like at its worst. And some of the time, it gets pretty uh, heated in debate prep. Uh, uh, Senator Portman's telling a story now about how Cindy McCain actually left the room crying during debate prep once. Uh, but um, uh, my favorite moment was uh, with Senator McCain, and this has been out in the public, uh, we were going back and forth before a primary debate out in California. And I was playing the moderator and questioning him. And uh, it was actually a, a question and answer on gay marriage. And the, the, the senator had given kind of an ambiguous answer on MSNB hard, uh, MSNBC hardball a few uh, days before the prep session. And so I really wanted to kind of get him hardened down on his answer. And I was going back and forth, back and forth, and finally, he just dropped his head and said, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Mark Salter, who was McCain's alter ego in the room, said, O'Donnell is done what the North Vietnamese could not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, that was, uh, it was kind of a memorable story. The senator looks at it a little bit differently than I do. <laughs> but, but we, you know, we have to really put them through. My job is to to really make them see what could absolutely be the worst. And I look at it like a batter in a batter's box. You know, before they get to the batter's box in the on-deck circle, 
they swing a couple bats, they swing a bat with a weight on it. So when they're in the batter's box, it feels a lot lighter. And so, you know, I'm willing to have the candidate like me less if when they go out on that stage, it, they're, they're totally prepared and confident in their own abilities. And then hopefully when they leave that stage, they'll like you more because of what you put up there. Yeah, hopefully. Carol. Well, as a moderator, very different kind of preparation. Mm -hmm. um, I was the first woman and the first person of color to moderate a presidential debate in 1992. And they were trying the town hall format for the very first time. And I was called and was given five days to prepare for the debate, unlike the people that were named in August and have had plenty of time. I had five days to prepare. And one of the frustrations was it had never been tried before. There weren't any tapes I could go and look at and see how people did it. Um, and so I just felt I've got to prepare myself on these candidates. I had three, which was unusual. I had Ross Perot and Clinton and President Bush. So I had to do ex extra special preparation. And for five days, I was immersed in the candidates' positions on every issue that there was. I looked at things so that I would be able to catch them if there were contradictions in which they had said something one time and another time said something else. Um, I couldn't sleep. I was a nervous wreck. Then I start getting calls from women saying, well, you're the first woman. You've got to do a really good job, so you don't embarrass us. In the... <laughs> and then I start hearing from black people who were like, well, you're the first black person to ever do this debate. Don't embarrass you. You've got to represent. So as if I didn't have pressure enough, I feel I've got the weight of 50% of the population uh, <laughs> looking at me and making sure that I did a good job. And so I had the town hall format, which meant I didn't get to ask questions. I had to make sure that the undecided voters that were chosen to sit in the audience, 209 of them, uh, got their questions answered from the candidates. And the Commission on Presidential Debates had given me like a 30-page memorandum of the ground rules of this debate. Um, and I was given the opportunity to follow up on questions, but my main job was to make sure that the candidates answered the people's questions. And I liked the whole idea of the town hall, that, that a participatory democracy, that our people could ask questions themselves of the candidates. So I liked that format. Um, it was um, something that I was terrified when the lights I went into the room, and it's one minute to nine, and then I get a cue in my ear, go. And it's like 90 minutes, mm -hmm. and there's no break. The train has left the station, and as soon as I heard go, I was fine. I had been experienced at doing live television for a long time, so it wasn't uh, fear of being live, but it was... I've got to do this good job and make sure the people's questions are answered. My debate ended up being very special. And I was here at Harvard with a, for a symposium after my debate. Because the conventional wisdom is that debates don't really change a lot of minds. They just reinforce what you already feel about the candidates. But something can happen that can make things change. And in my debate, uh, many political scientists agreed that my town hall debate had really cost George Bush the election. And that was because he was seen, and I didn't know it, because I'm in the middle of the crowd. Uh, I can't see what the television, what the people are seeing at home. I didn't know he looked at his watch three mm. times. He looked at his watch three times. And a young black woman asked him a question about how the national debt affected him. And I knew she was talking about the recession, but George Bush, who I had great respect for, um, he said, I don't get it. And I was trying to explain, she means the recession, you know, are, are you feeling it personally? He started off on 
being at a black church with pregnant teenagers, and it was like, what the heck is he talking about? And I'm like, George, you could hit this out of the park, that you don't feel it, but that you understand other people feel it. Um, so he just, he just blew that question, and the fact that he said, I don't get it, kind of stuck in people's minds, that he did not get that people were hurting because of the economy. And then Bill Clinton walks up within arm's length of this young black woman and says something like, I feel your pain. I, I know what you're going through. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Yes. <laughs> Thank you he's for doing got a good, yeah, He's got a good <laughs> impression of it. Um, so uh, until I saw the tape the next day, I didn't appreciate how well uh, Clinton had done during the debate and how poorly it looked that George Bush had done it. Everybody's asking me, where did he have to go? What is he looking at his watch? This, so he wants to get out of there. Um, and so that, I think, and many people agree, that cost Bush the election, uh, that people felt he really didn't get it. And I felt very sorry for him. The other thing is, I thought I was doing a great job, okay? <laughs> I used the principles that I used as a reporter for years and years and years, and that was to be fair, to be objective, to be professional, to, be, um, to make sure that the public interest was served. And so after the debate in the spin room, the Republicans went around saying that I had cost George Bush the debate. I made him look bad and that I had thrown the debate to Clinton, that I had made him look good. Um, absolutely untrue. So it's, it's kind of those things where I'm used to, after 40 years in the business, blame the media, okay? If something goes wrong, it's the media's fault. It's her fault. She's a liberal Democrat. She must be. She's a black woman. Uh, so she must be a liberal Democrat. And um, she made George Bush look bad. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that I was feeling good. It was the pinnacle of my career to be able to do a debate. It's what every reporter wants to be able to do. You're on every channel. You're seen around the world. Um, and so I was feeling quite good about myself and thought I had done a really good job. The next day, Rush Limbaugh got on his radio show. <laughs> <laughs> and he spent 15 minutes just knocking me. A feminazi, uh, 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 liberal, pinko, communist, um, that I had, that I never should have been chosen. Why would they ever choose somebody like her to be uh, the moderator? And I started getting death threats. I mm. started, I had bodyguards for a week. ABC uh, had bodyguards following me um, home at night and following me wherever I had to go. Uh, I was terrified. So, you know, people think this moderator job is a simple job and that all you have to do is ask questions. Uh, but that kind of stuff can happen. And it, it, it was really awakening to me. I never in my life mm -hmm. felt frightened. And I felt very frightened. Well, Mark. Uh, well, let me just talk about some overview thoughts about debating in general. The stakes are enormously high. Uh, there are three opportunities, really, when people running for president have an opportunity to substantially affect public opinion. When they announce their campaigns, when they have their convention speech at the convention and pick their vice president, and the debates. Uh, and it's the only time where the candidate, it's arguably the most impactful, potentially, because it's, it's the time when voters see them in an uncontrolled environment and see them on their feet when it's not a controlled situation, which they do in their announcement at the convention. Uh, so uh, the, just to give you a sense of perspective, uh, George W. Bush, when he ran in 2000, understood that what his father had called, Jim Lehrer's book is called Tension City, 
because that's what George H.W. Bush called the debates, Tension City. And by the way, I got a good sense of, from reading his book, just how much tension there is on the moderators as well, mm -hmm. arguably as much as there is on the candidates. So mm -hmm. congratulations on, on, uh, on what, was, what was really a great yeah. job. But um, the, uh, but Bush went into his uh, campaign in very much the same circumstances as Mitt Romney is today. Uh, Tad and his crew did a great job in September. We had a good September. Yeah. And we called it Black <laughs> September because it's very similar. We had our convention first. Yeah. Gore had his convention, stepped on our bounce. We had a series of bad events, bad incidents. Everybody thought the campaign was completely screwed up, thought we should all be fired. We were three to five points down, just like Romney, and we went into the debates. And, uh, and, and over the course of the three debates, uh, and we can talk more about this, but, but it, we were judged to have won those three debates. And we went from three to five down to three up and ultimately won the presidency, uh, largely on, on George Bush's performance of the debates. Uh, so flash forward uh, four years, and we're running against John Kerry. And now this is where I just setting the stage for, uh, for the debates tonight. Again, so Romney's very much in the same position as George Bush in 2000, but President Obama's very much in the same position as George Bush was in 2004, uh, which is an incumbent president. And it's a miserable to have to get up there and defend yourself against the challenger. And it's, you, you've been president, you've, you've basically got to get up there and defend your record of four years. And it's a, it's a couple of hours of, of attack. And so it's, it's, I, I, there's just psychologically, it's a great place for a challenger like Romney to be because people haven't seen him on stage. But just by virtue of getting on the stage with the president, he gets elevated in stature. People don't know that much about him. They've heard a lot about him. And this will be an opportunity for the public to really see him in person and make a judgment. So I, I don't underestimate or diminish at all what this means tonight for, for Mitt Romney's chances. Now, he's obviously got a big challenges, but, but there's a real opportunity for him tonight to, to, to break through. Well, you know, I, I've had the privilege of working in debate prep with a lot of candidates running for many offices, for president, for vice president in our country and, and outside our country, people running for president and prime minister, and also people who run for senate and everything. And it's just always a wonderful opportunity to participate in those debate preps. I actually played Bill Weld against John Silver, who just uh, hmm. passed away when he ran for governor. And six months later, Silver hired me because he said, no one ever beat me in a debate before. And I wound up working <laughs> there for two years. So debate prep is a great way to get a job, too, if anyone asks you to do debate <laughs> prep. But I would say of all the many uh, experiences I've had, my favorite debate prep experience was with Senator Benson in 1988 when I worked as a campaign manager. And, and believe it or not, when that campaign started, after he was selected, one of his first instructions to me was, and this sounds incredible, but it's true, I don't, he said, I don't want to do the debate. I don't think this is good, Quayle's young guy, telegenic. And, and so we actually looked into whether or not we could cancel it, and it was all set, we could. And, and, but Senator Benson, I think, understood that he went into that debate at some disadvantage against a, you know, a, someone from a more television age candidate. And he prepared meticulously, and I think Governor Romney's probably doing that right now, uh, for, for weeks and months. And as we went into that session, when we first started off, uh, honestly, he was not that good. I, I can tell you, there was a good reason why he didn't want to debate. He was having problems with the light and getting the timing and everything else. But we worked really hard, and we had a great group of people who were participating in the session, and we had a wonderful candidate who was absorbing everything. And as we got to the, to the end of the process, and we actually did debate camp for the last week, believe it or not, and all we, you know, we just debate prep, debate prep. And as we got to the end of the process, and he was getting you know, better and better, uh, we actually um, flew to Omaha, Nebraska the night before. We had a surprise rally and a hangar there for him. To, he, we had his two best friends were, and their wives were flying with us on the plane. And Joe O'Neill, who you know, was the chief of staff. And, uh, you know, we gave our seats up to them. And, and, and we, you know, we, we, and, and so the day of the debate, we recommended that he rest. But he was so determined to be prepared for that debate that he said, you know, I want to do another session that morning. So as we went into the session, uh, we, you know, uh, I, I had worked for Governor Dukakis, and although I was a campaign manager, I didn't really have a relationship with Senator Benson, but the chief of staff, Joe O'Neill, had a long relationship with him. So I said to Joe, listen, is, is there something that would bother him, and maybe throw him off? Because we want to, you know, throw, give him a question and throw him off a little bit, see how he handles it. And he said, you know, he's very private about his faith and religion. He really doesn't like to talk about that, you know, publicly. 
So Susan Estrich, who was a campaign manager, was playing Judy Woodruff in debate prep. I said to Susan, listen, ask him a question about religion or something like that. You know, just see if we can really shake him up. And so Susan asked him a question about, you know, faith. And, and Benson, and this is after about an hour of prep, on the morning of the debate itself. And so Benson gave an answer that was so magnificent, you know, and it began by saying, there are certain times in life we turn to God. These are moments of, and you know, and it was, we just sat there for 90 seconds and listened to it. And it was just stunning in its eloquence and, and how beautiful it was. And also, because we knew, this, he didn't want to talk about this, okay? He did not want to talk about this, and yet he put it all together. And so I said, so I stood up and I said, excuse me, Senator, I think we're gonna stop right there. And so he said, did I do something wrong? And I said, and I said no, Senator. You are like a finely tuned Stradivarius right now, and we're not going to play you until 9 o'clock tonight, okay? <laughs> and, and, and of course, he went in and did what he did, and they're still showing the clips of it, okay? Just in case some of the young folks... <laughs> yeah, you, you may not have been alive when this happened, but in, in, in 1988, the vice presidential debate, Lloyd Benson against Dan Quayle, he had a magnificent debate, and there was one moment when... Senator Quayle, who, by the way, people forget this part, Quayle in that debate was asked three times whether or not he would be ready to assume the presidency. The third time he was asked by Britt Hume, okay, who in those days worked for ABC. Mm -hmm. And Britt, and he, you know, Tom Brokaw had asked it, and, and he wasn't really answering the question, so finally the third time Senator Quayle invoked the fact that he, Quayle, had served in the Congress as long as Jack Kennedy had served in the Congress, President Kennedy, therefore had as much experience as he did, and therefore would be ready to assume the presidency. And Senator uh, Benson turned and looked at him and said, you know, Senator, I knew Jack Kennedy. I served with Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you don't know Jack Kennedy. You know, and that was the end of, <laughs> that was the end of it. And, and it was a great moment. But it was great to see someone, and again, you may see this again tonight, who people didn't think was prepared, who did his homework, who spent his time, who got himself into a position where he could do that, and who delivered a stunning performance in that debate. Unfortunately, didn't help out the top of the ticket very much, but nevertheless, it's a demonstration that preparation and skill and everything coming together in a powerful way can really have magnificent results for anybody in, in, in debate. Uh, let me ask Mark and Carol the same question that I'm gonna ask Tad and Brett, a question that I gave them a heads up about. But, so for the two books in the middle, what, what should we be looking for tonight or expecting um, as viewers uh, when we watch this debate? <laughs> I've been on so many shows today and been asked this question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody so what are you knows. Gonna be, what are you going to be looking for? Just, like, just as, a, as a citizen, as somebody who's you know, watched debates. And well, what, what, what are you I have for? been covering presidential campaigns since 1968, Nixon, Humphrey. <laughs> and I've been watching debates for mm -hmm. all of these years. And uh, I'm a political junkie. And um, I have come to the conclusion that debates are about style and not substance. People that I meet and talk to say, I want to see how they do. They don't want to hear what they have to say. Uh, they want to see those, those remarks. I think they'll be looking for Romney to um, be more comfortable in his skin and more uh, warm and appealing uh, to the public. Can he come through the television set and, and touch them some way? The gestures, the smirks, the, all of those little things. They're looking at body language and they're looking at how forcefully, forcefully they speak and how well they speak. Uh, and I don't think they're going to be, everybody says, yes, we want specifics on Romney's plan to save the economy. If he spends tonight, you know, a good amount of time trying to explain the numbers and <laughs> of how they're going to be massaged and what is, people are just going to turn off. Now remember, people are watching TV. And you know what you're doing when you watch TV. You may be cooking, you may be eating. Your child may come and ask you a question. You're not riveted, except the reporters, okay? <laughs> they are riveted to the TV set. So people get bits and pieces of things, and um, they're not listening, I don't think, very closely to, to specifics. They really want to see how they perform. It's a performance art, okay? 
Uh, Obama cannot come across as the angry black man. Um, I understand they don't like each other very much. Oh. And I think everybody knows that. I can't think of two candidates that have been more different mm. ever. Mm. <laughs> black man from a poor background, white man from a wealthy background, uh, completely different uh, kinds of people all together. And, um, but the only thing they have in common is they're both Harvard grads. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they both went to Harvard. Um, but so I, I think people are going to be looking at that kind yeah. of thing and really not interested in uh, minutia sure. on uh, taxes and so on. Okay, Mark, having learned my question, Mark, why don't I ask, what are you going to be looking for? <laughs> well, strategically, the Obama game plan is pretty simple. Do no harm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he wants to have a, if the debate is a tie, he wins. So all he's got to do is, is be clear, concise, cool, above it, not lose, not let Romney get under his skin. And uh, he needs to be composed. He needs to be presidential. And uh, it's pretty simple. Romney's is much different. Pe people feel like they know the president. They know one way or the other. They have an opinion. It's pretty well formed. Mitt Romney is still a mystery to a lot of people. And that's, that's a, the big opportunity for him. He's got an opportunity to reveal himself, to show who he is. And, and he's, got some, he's, got some, he's got some serious negatives that he's got to deal with, like this 47% issue. Now, that's, that's, that's something that is in the well and has caused him a, a lot of collateral damage in the last couple of weeks. So he's got to find a way to convince the public that's watching tonight that he cares about all of America, that he wants to be president for all of America. I mean, that's a fundamental strategic objective that he has. Now, when people are running for president, when voters are thinking about voting for president, they're not look, sitting there looking about what's his position on X or Y or Z. They are looking for somebody who can be commander in chief. And, and that means that they are looking at a constellation of attributes, not issues. And the three attributes that are most important when people are looking at a president and they'll be looking for in the debate is the perception of a strong leader. Do, they, do I trust him? Does he share my values? So those are the three overriding attributes that people will be looking for tonight from Mitt Romney. Is he strong? Can he stand up for the president? Does he say something that I can trust and believe him? Is he credible? And does he understand my life? Does he get my values? And so those are the things that are going to be most important. So strategically, they're going to be spending a lot of time thinking about how can we communicate those attributes through the Mom course of the debate. Something. And by the way, uh, you know, they have been preparing a lot. And, 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 and while all of that's going to be important, there's going to be a soundbite or two. And mm -hmm. you know, the media's going to play it over and over again. And, and, I, and I think that Romney Camp has done a lot of considerable thinking about that. Can I ask you something? Sure. Uh, people can't wring their brains out like a sponge and come to the debate tonight with a fresh mind, okay, that Romney can start writing on. Uh, they still have in their mind that 47% uh, a house with a garage that has elevators for cars, uh, his offshore accounts. They're, they're, they're coming with all of that baggage that Romney has um, amassed uh, during this campaign. Um, is there I, I don't see much chance that he's going to be able to change people's minds about that. How's he going to explain that 47%? I don't see how he can do it. Well, it's a challenge. I mean, it won't be easy. Uh, but, you know, this is a character test. And he's got it. This is an opportunity for him to reveal. A, listen, there are Mitt Romney, in, uh, he, there's a, when we think about character and integrity, uh, you know, those things that you do when, when, pe when, when people aren't watching are a real test of your character. He's done a lot of things when people weren't watching uh, that are incredibly charitable. There's a lot of the, his, his faith uh, mm -hmm. and things that he's done in missionary work sure. that he hasn't talked about because that's the way he was raised, not to talk about those kind of things. But, but those are the kind of things that he should be able to connect up somehow. And he has to articulate if he wants to win the presidency in order to explain to people why he's done the things that he's done or the perceptions that he's had. No question, it's a lot of baggage. He's got a big challenge before him, but that's why he's down. But I thought it would be fun to ask Tad, the Democrat, to get, tell us the advice he would give to mm -hmm. Mitt Romney mm -hmm. if he were 
getting him ready for tonight yeah. or going into tonight? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'd give him the same advice I give to every, everybody um, that I work with, just generally, and then I would have a very specific piece of advice for tonight. First, I think there's four critical elements to success in, in televised debate. You know, first is having a message and delivering it with some repetition so that people, by the end of the 90 minutes, they actually come away with something. The second, and I agree with Carol, that it's about style. Richard Nixon said, it, you know, what he learned was it's much more important how you look than what you say, you know, in a presidential debate. I think he learned a hard lesson, and it was an important lesson. Uh, the third thing I would look for is a demonstration of presidential capacity. It's really the, the, the capacity to be president is the highest threshold in our politics. And, and to go out and to look like a president, to act like a president, and to speak like one about issues, that, that's an important takeaway that people have. And, uh, and then finally, and most importantly, uh, as Mark alluded to, uh, I would look to see if there was a big moment, a moment or two, that could live on in the sound bites. And, and I think the strategic advice, if I were in charge of Romney campaign right now, that I would give him would be this, that listen, don't try to get nine outs in one inning tonight, okay? We've got a long way to go. You've got a fundamental problem. Actually, John Silver once said this to me. I was working in another campaign. I came back to see him, and I showed him an ad, and the ad wasn't really a great ad for my candidate I was working for, and he said, let me tell you the biggest lesson I learned running for governor of Massachusetts. They're not going to vote for you unless they like you, okay? And it was, a, it was a, a very wise insight, and I think if I were advising Romney tonight, I would say, listen, here's our strategic goal for this debate. And I think it's doable, because I worked for Walter Mondale in 1984, and in the first debate against Reagan, I talked to, you know, talked to the pollster the next day, and, and Rondale's, Mondale's net favorable had gone up 23 points in one night. I mean, I don't know if we can have that movement these days, but nevertheless, it was dramatic. And I would tell Romney, listen, here's our goal t for tonight. We're going to come out of this debate with a lot more people liking you. As a matter of fact, more, more people are going to like you than dislike you, which has been a problem through this whole campaign. And after we do that, and after we set some of the parameters for the substantive debate, we're going to move on that you know, in the following two debates as well. So let's not try to do it all tonight, but let's start doing it tonight. That's what I would tell them. Okay, great. And then let's but, turn. But, but, just add on that. but, but yeah. that's what's tough for the candidate. You know, it's right. like, okay, how do I be more likable? You know, it's like, <laughs> be more yourself. <laughs> be more myself. You know, I've been doing this for two years. You know, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. As the candidate debate. who's gone through some of these debates before, yes. Right. I could, I mean, <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, and let's, let's turn the tables a little bit again. Um, so, Brett, the Republican, what would you tell the president if you were advising him? You know, I'm a huge football fan. And one thing I, I've never understand, understood in football is when a team gets a big lead, they play the prevent defense. Because a, a lot of times, I don't know what the percentage is, a lot of times those teams end up giving up the lead, making the game too close, and sometimes even losing. The conventional wisdom is the president needs to just play defense, play rope-a-dope, play to a tie, and he wins the debate. And I think that's a huge mistake for the president. I would say you are the president. You occupy the high ground. And so you need to be on offense. I don't mean attacking Mitt Romney, but you need to be advocating for your message strongly, right. not playing defense. Because really, when the president, both of these men, when they get defensive, they are really bad at debates. Right. That's where they make the most mistakes. And so the president has to be the president tonight. He has to stay on offense and not let Mitt Romney put him on defense. He, he has a strategy that he has to execute. And I would say that he needs to make sure that he executes the strategy and leads the debate rather than follows the debate where Mitt Romney or even the moderator takes the debate. So I. I, I disagree with the conventional wisdom is play rope a dope, play to a tie, because I think that that would be judged as a loss. When audiences view debates, particularly between two men, the person that is more aggressive in the debate is most commonly thought to be the victor. Mm -hmm. And so the, the president should not shy away from, from being uh, 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 forceful and on offense during the debate tonight. Yeah. Right. Well, as the moderator, I'm not going to turn this into a town hall. Um, and ask you to come up and ask our panel some questions. We've got four microphones in the usual spots. Uh, we ask if you come up, please uh, follow the traditional rules here in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, tell us your name, give us your affiliation, and make sure your question is brief. And while I wish I had a little timer like they do in the debates, um, and don't all jump up at once. Thank you. Come on, so come on. You're going to ask an awesome question. You're going to inspire all these other members of the audience. 
<laughs> no pressure. You know, I, mean, I know you've been prepping for the question. Don't worry about it. Thanks for everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Cates. I am an MPA2 student here. Uh, I actually have a question about um, President Obama's strategy. How much should he consider, A, his likelihood of winning, and B, his coattails? Should he be considering tonight in debate sort of the congressional races that are also going? You talked about maybe staying behind and staying you know, less aggressive, or you want him to push to be more aggressive. Is that something that he should be considering, or should he be focusing only on himself? Um, well, uh, I think in the first debate, he should focus on himself. I think his race is not won yet, and he should concentrate on it. However, one of the most important findings that came out yesterday in the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, at least from me, was the fact that since they began that poll in the late 80s, for the first time, the respondents in the poll said they would like to see the president and the Congress be of the same party. That is a very stunning piece of information, okay? And I believe if the president can be successful tonight, can continue maybe to put some space between he and Romney, that by the time he gets to maybe the third debate or even the second, depending on how tonight goes, I think a message along those lines now to an audience, 52% of Americans who are saying it for the first time since the 80s, that's good message terrain for him. I would not do it tonight. Okay, I would just try to win tonight. And if he does, and the things go well, then maybe there's room for that kind of message in a later debate. That, I mean, that, that gets sort of to my point that I was making earlier, where I, I disagree with Brett a little bit, in the sense that he doesn't need to go swinging for the fences tonight to try and draft everybody up in the party. I mean, he doesn't need to throw out a bunch of bold policy ideas or, or respond to the criticisms from Mitt Romney. And, and uh, he needs to be presidential. He needs to be clear, he needs to be firm, uh, but he needs, to, he needs to be like the executive in charge. But he doesn't need to start throwing roundhouses at the same time in, in order to sort of draft up the entire Democratic Party. He needs to run his game plan. If he does it, he'll draft the party up on his own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, question right here. Hi, thanks. Uh, Nick Byard, second year student at the Kennedy School. Um, and I'm wondering uh, your perspectives on the post-debate analysis and sort of the spin zone and how, that, how have you seen that change over the years and um, just mm -hmm. sort of your perspective on, on what, what to look for tonight and its importance. Sure. <laughs> I've been in a spin zone. I guess you've oh, been yeah. in it. <laughs> uh, the spin zone is really for the reporters, okay? And the Republican campaign officials and the Democratic campaign officials come down and try to spin the debate in favor of their candidate. Okay, they will say that clearly we won. I mean, don't you remember when he said such and such and such? Well, the reporter's reaction is, <laughs> we know they ha they're saying what they have to say and that they're trying to get us on their side. But we have watched the debate, okay? And we don't really need um, to hear them. So it, it, it's a lot of fun to uh, hear them try to put the best case scenario on something that happened. But it's like, it's just for amusement, really. <laughs> well, I, I'll disagree with that, because it was because of our spin in the 2000 first debate yeah. that we won. We didn't really win that debate. We won it in the 24 hours after the debate because of what we were able to do talking to reporters afterwards. What were you telling can you, them? Can you, we were telling them. <laughs> Can you remind he, the audience? He, well, he yeah, lied and he what, sighed. Yeah. That's what well, they call Well, he right? lied and he sighed. There were, there were three instances in which he was factually wrong, and we right. made the reporters aware of that, oh, and God. a lot of them weren't. Yes. And we drew attention to the fact that he was very condescending, and he was doing all these weird body movements and sighing into his microphone, and they weren't aware of that. <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, it was, you know, that night, Gord won the debate. By the next day, yeah. he lost it. Yeah, listen, uh, regrettably, uh, unfortunately, that's true. And, uh, but I, I'd just like to say something else, because I'm a big believer in spin, too. But I will tell you, the best, my best, the most successful spin experience was when we didn't do it, uh, which was 1988. We decided, Leslie Dock, who now works for Walmart, and I were, were do, sort of in charge of the spin room thing for Benson. And we decided to bring in a couple of surrogates to do some spin for us. And we, we had four people. The young governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, the young senator from Tennessee, Al Gore, <laughs> and Bill Gray, who is the head of of the Black Caucus and was phenomenal, and I learned how to score debates from him, and Dennis Eckhart, who played quail in debate prep and was sensational. And those guys, I want to tell you, particularly Clinton, okay, <laughs> on the spin floor, 
unbelievable, just unbelievable. And, and so having the sort of right people doing the spin who have their own credibility and we're able to take it and move with it, I think that's when we really got the whole Benson thing to that next level, you know. And, and I don't mean to pile on, but, uh, but you go know, ahead if, and do it, right? if, <laughs> if, if, if the spin room wasn't effective, there wouldn't be, you know, over a thousand reporters that will trail every spinner in that room tonight. So it, it's certainly something the media loves. It's part that. of the spectacle. We do that, but... Just to humor us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear what you have to say, but in terms of affecting the reporting on the debate, I think it doesn't have that much effect. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Bolger, an alum of Harvard. And um, it, it seems like the economy is an important uh, issue that may be debated. Uh, and it also seems that Mitt Romney has been uh, financially successful in business. Uh, and I obviously appreciate the need to be likable and uh, to be humble. But one metric of measuring success in business is one's wealth that they've accumulated and built. And I'm wondering um, if you could comment on how effective a strategy it's been to maybe retreat from um, highlighting that financial success. I understand the importance of being humble. But uh, it, it, it's curious, at least during the primary process, then also now, that he's um, been criticized both by conservatives and certainly by his opponents for uh, his wealth. Well, I, I, I hope that that's uh, it's a great point. And, I, and I, I think that, in part, Romney has suffered from uh, a failure to articulate earlier on in the campaign uh, a, 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 a narrative about his success in business mm -hmm. and to and to explain the Bain story on his right. own terms rather than have it explained the w in, in response to Ob Obama's attack on Bain, which happened early this summer with a lot of resources. And I think, again, I, I think that the Romney campaign suffered from not having been able to articulate that story on their own. And, I, and you know, it's very late in the game and not a lot of time to do it tonight, but, but I think that that's a good story. I mean, I think that's, that's part of, he says he's the fix guy and understand the economy because he's built a business and, uh, and, and that whole sort of private equity story is a complicated one, but I think one that people need to understand. Yeah, can, can, can I say, I agree, with, I agree with that, and I think they should have told the story, and there was a way to tell it more honestly, you know, and, and more powerfully. But, you know, I think one of the reasons we're not going to hear a lot about it is, you know, the front page story in the New York Times two days ago about Cayman Island accounts and the tax advantage that he derived from it. And it's very, very complicated. Uh, in the Obama campaign, I worked for Senator Kennedy in 1994 against Mitt Romney here in Massachusetts. We made some pretty tough ads, okay, about Bain and, and Romney, and they had a big and powerful impact on the race. And I think the Obama people have decided that that was a, a good thing to do. I think they sort of, you know, made the bed for Romney, and then when Romney did 47%, he got in the bed and pulled the covers over, and everybody was like, oh my god, and it's true. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> it's all true. So, great. Back up here to the front microphone. Good evening, my name is Cammie and I am a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. My question tonight is uh, what are candidates in the debate uh, advised to do when they are asked a controversial question which can cause them to lose the median voters? Don't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> May I tell you a typical yeah. thing that politicians do and reporters are on to it. Um, they get a tough question and they'll go, that's a very interesting question. Mm. Uh, but let me tell you about such and such, and I'll get back to that. Uh, and they start going, and if you're not sharp, you'll forget that you had that they didn't answer the question that was originally asked. And so you have to go back and say, but you didn't really answer the question. Um, so you have to be very alert to that. But that you watch; they'll try to yeah, that avoid is that one question. Of the yeah. yeah. Well, but, but uh, Mark, you. Uh, yeah, take just a second to tell a little bit of the story here because this relates directly to your question. One thing we haven't said tonight, I think all of us would agree on, that the most important thing in working with candidates for debate prep is to build in them a sense of confidence. Absolutely. The powerful debate performances are all about confidence. Candidates who go out with confidence are, are almost always the candidates you know, who come out with the most confidence. That, that shows in their, in their performance. And it also affects them psychologically and how they, how they think about their answers what happens with almost all candidates as they're prepping for debates is they get fixated on what they don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just, they stay up at night thinking, oh God, it's going to be a question about, you know, something in the Middle East or something, you know. And the problem with that is mm -hmm. that that's inexhaustible. Right. That's infinite. 
So you have to somehow get in their heads and say, stop. Okay? We've briefed you adequately, more than adequately, on everything you can know. You're never going to know everything. Okay? And stop trying to. At a certain point, accept what you know. Don't fear what you don't know. But really focus on the things that you do know and, and focus on them really well. Now, here's where I want to just take a second to tell a story. I left the McCain campaign after I did the primary because I said when I joined the campaign that if Barack Obama were elected in the general election, I wouldn't want to work in the general election because I didn't want to be in a position to attack Barack Obama, whose candidacy I thought would be good for the country, even though I disagree with him politically, and I still supported McCain and voted for him. So I left the campaign, which was very hard to do because nobody thought Barack Obama was actually going to be elected. This was two years before it happened. So I left the campaign. In September, as Brett was describing, the, the Philadelphia, Arizona situation with Sarah Palin, I got a call on a Sunday night saying, we have a meltdown. Can you come to Sedona and take over the debate prep for Sarah Palin? And I said, no, I can't. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh -oh. I, and this sort of went back and forth and back and forth. And I was feeling guilty about the fact that I left the campaign. But so they, they, I said, I'm not going to come take it over. But they said, what would you do? And I said, I'll come down for one night, and I'll just do some debate kind of one-on-one principles. I'm not going to talk about strategy to attack Obama, any of that. So I went down and, uh, and the first night, and it was an absolute train wreck. Mm. And, uh, and there was this little prep session, and it was a, really a disaster. And everybody knew it, inclu and, and, and including and especially Sarah Palin. And it was an odd situation, a small room. We all left the room and went out into the night and then realized we left her in there all alone. They turned to me and said, that's what you're here for, get back in there. <laughs> and so I had to go back in and spend about an hour with her where I saw two sides of Sarah Palin that were fascinating. The first one was a side that nobody's, or very few people have seen, which is, I mean, she had really fallen apart. I mean, she was, she was, uh, uh, she was very emotional. She, I mean, she was crying. She was, you know, she was saying that uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm, I, there's no way I can pull this off. I'm not prepared for this. I'm going to let down the campaign. I'm going to let down John McCain. I'm going to let down the Republican Party. You know, this is, this is, just, I, 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 this is impossible. There's no way I can do it. So then I did what I came there to do, which was I set over the next 60 minutes to rebuild her confidence. And I did that simply by saying, reminding her of what she did when she ran for governor. I saw the tapes when she debated there. And I said, listen, you were up against the big boys then. It was a big stage. You were just a mayor taking on the you know, the guys who've been in, in, in politics for years, you debated there, I saw the tapes, you did great. This is the same thing, a little bit of bigger stage, a little hotter spotlight, but it's the same thing. Talk, and you talked you talk about your reform message, and, and you were great. You were talking about the things you've done on the reform thing. So think about those issues, and think about what you, what you really believe in, in terms of your sort of maverick reform side, and focus on those issues, because there's a way to, I'm getting back to the whole point of the question, which is, even if you get asked what you don't know, you can go back to that kind of reform Sarah Palin, you know, the fighter in Alaska, and get back to that. And then by the end of that hour, you know, she was like, I'm going to get him. I'm going to, by golly, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hit it out of the park. And, you know, I know I can do this. And, and I left going, I'm not so sure. But, uh, <laughs> but sure enough, five days later, and this gets to another point that we kind of alluded to tonight, which is debates are about expectations. Right. She had very low expectations. Biden had really high expectations. All she had to do was exceed the expectations, which she did. Can, can I, yeah. uh, you know, the, I think the best, and I agree with all that and being able to pivot off stuff, that's the key to teach them how to do it. But the best way to prepare them for a very difficult question is to make sure you've done the work in debate prep so that when they're asked that question, they've been asked it before. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and for example, and I hold the Benson debate prep up as the, the gold standard of debate prep. He was asked 11 questions in that debate, okay? We had 10 of them. Not only that we anticipated, but Bob Shrum, who used to be my former partner, we brought him in to rewrite the answers. We had written answers to those 10 questions. We had a lot more, but the, we, got the, we got 10 out of 11 where we had written answers that he felt comfortable with that he had committed basically to memory. Okay? And the other one question we didn't get was about natural gas production, okay? which he knew more about than any. We, we could never know as much as he did. And, and that's how you do it. You, you figure out those questions. And if you get them, and, and, you know, I remember once we were flying in with Benson the first time we went to San Francisco. So we're flying in the bed and we said, how, how, what's your position on gay rights? Now, trust me, he hadn't been asked that a lot in Texas, okay? And, well, you know, in 1988. Yeah, 1988. This was like, and he was like, rah, rah, and, and so we landed the plane and we're like, we're not going out there. And so I said, um, 
the senator's tired, we're going to the hotel, see you later, and left all the cameras standing there. And so the story was that he was old and he was tired, and, well, you know, we started, and so by the next day at noon, he had an answer for that, that was fine for California and everybody else. But that's what you do. You prepare, and you anticipate, and then you work at it, and you get there, and then when they go out and they're asked that question, they can handle it. And Ted, yeah. I think everybody else on the stage would say that in most debates, especially when you've had a chance to really prep the candidate, that statistic you cited is fairly common. You know, 90% of the yeah. questions you probably, you didn't necessarily know which ones they were going to ask, sure. but you had prepared answers for. Right. We that, used to, you know, with the McCain campaign, I, that was one of the things I prided myself in was making sure we knew the questions. So we kept a very extensive question book. We'd gone through every question that had been in every presidential, vice presidential debate, even some Senate debates that were high profile. And our question book was, you know, in excess of 200 pages long. We just wanted to make sure there wasn't a question that we hadn't talked about. So you might pivot. The answer might be a pivot. The answer might be the perfect answer that gets you out of that tough right. situation, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 All right, we're going to have to get, make this the last question. Uh, Hi, my name is Jamal Glenn. I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. So I actually find the entire debate structure incredibly disappointing. I think we have two really well accomplished, articulate indiv individuals who could have a series of really high level, thoughtful conversations about policy, but we don't. I think they're very dumbed down and soundbite driven. Can you talk at all about the process in which they haven't improved, the, the structure of the debates has improved over time? Yeah, I'd like to speak to that. I mean, I think that, you know, it's a kind of a vicious cycle. Candidates blame the media, and the media blames candidates for why the debates aren't better uh, in terms of their content. And you know, in reality, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, for instance, we know in preparing our candidates that we, we want to create a moment. I think Mark and Tad have both talked about that, that we're, we're trying to create a moment that the press will pay attention to that will be run on the news over and over and over again. So that sometimes undercuts the substantive side of debate prep. And, you know, Carol's right that a lot of it is how you perform, that it's a performance. And so that starts to undercut some of the substance uh, of debates. But the, the formats hurt them as well. Now, I'm interested to see how the format goes tonight with mm -hmm. the open discussion. Yeah, why don't you explain a little bit uh, about that? The format tonight is a little, is very different. They, they've never used this format before in presidential debates. There are six 15-minute segments, mm -hmm. and uh, Jim Lehrer will ask a question to begin each of those segments. Uh, the candidates will each get two minutes to respond, and then there'll be 11 minutes of free-flowing discussion. Now, in, in a in an ideal world, that might be a lot better format because the candidates will get to talk about their positions. The first three segments are all devoted to the economy. Then there's a section on health care and a section on governance and how we would govern. So uh, in an ideal world, it looks like that there might be a lot more substance to the debates. And I'll be interested to see how you react and, and, how, and how the media reacts to those. But, you know, the, the problem is uh, we don't have the... You know, we don't have the appetite anymore for link, true Lincoln-Douglas debates, for two men to stand on the stage <laughs> for three hours and go back and forth seven like Lincoln. They did yeah. one for seven and hours. We just don't, we don't have, uh, we, we, our attention spans won't, won't consume that anymore. And so, uh, unfortunately, that, that undercuts what could be, you know, a more substantive discussion. It's mm -hmm. hard to articulate. Mark tells a great story about Paul Begala and Bill Clinton in terms of, you know, Bill Clinton's answer on a substantive issue and Begala reminding him that you, you only have 90 seconds to deliver that. And so, uh, you, you know, it, it's hard to deliver a, a substantive answer in 90 seconds. I agree. May yeah. I ask you a question? Do you really want to hear a long debate, of, uh, a long answer or explanation of the Affordable Health Care Act and what should remain in it and what should not? And Single yeah, I mean, and, and I'd like to hear more of them, and I'd like, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to the free-form discussion, because I think a lot of the rhetoric that goes on prior to the debates, it goes unchallenged. Facts go unchallenged. The opposing viewpoint isn't present, and so, to me, the campaign really starts tonight. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how this format works. If yeah, yeah, I would just say that I yeah. think it's going to be really good to let these guys kind of go at each other, and, and that's based on work I did, I've done in Europe with, you know, on debates. 
outside the U.S., the debates are much more free-flowing. Okay, these guys, I mean, they roll them in there. I've done four, de you know, debate prep sessions and debates in Ireland in general elections. And they roll them in, and they ask the question, and then they go at each other. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's incredibly entertaining, okay? It's just, people love it. And I, and I think, in fact, if this thing takes off, we could possibly see something we've never seen in our debates before which is that the audiences actually will increase after the first debate. They usually, the first debate audience is the biggest, the first half hour of the first debate is the, is the largest, and I think if this is actually interesting, people will watch it and it'll be good. Well, on that note, let's join me in thanking our wonderful panel for tonight's discussion. <laughs> I've got, um, I have a few announcements. It's obviously we're going to be here for. So the watch party will obviously begin at 9. That's when the debate will start. Uh, we want to remind everybody you can continue to participate in the discussion on Twitter with the hashtag IOPDebate. Uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mark McKenna and Brett O'Donnell are going to do post-debate interviews uh, that we'll put up on the internet tomorrow. Uh, and so if you want to ask them questions that are, or submit questions that can be asked to them, submit those to askIOP, hashtag. Um, we're, the HKS and undergraduate Republicans and Democrats are going to have tables. Uh, so in the 30 minutes between now and when the uh, debates start, if you want to stop by, get information, sign up for their list, learn how to get involved with the campaigns uh, and get on their mailing list, we're happy to do that. That'll be stage left. And also tonight we've got uh, uh, China, China Central TV as well as local Channel 4 who are here filming. And so just as a reminder, when you're in the forum, you're, you could be on TV. Um, I mean, you were all just on TV through a live stream and you'll be preserved on YouTube forever. Um, but uh, a reminder about those too. And I think we've got some popcorn behind the stage. And uh, you know, some people will probably leave after the discussion. So if those who are looking for seats, uh, there may be some seats on the floor and up top. And we look forward to a really interesting debate. TV. Right above us. Oh. Big TV. Big TV. Big TV. So great. Thanks, everybody.